Welcome to a special episode of The Authority File. I'm your host, Bill Mickey. The next several episodes were all recorded straight off the exhibit hall floor at ACRL's annual conference, which concluded its four-day run in Cleveland, Ohio, April 10th through the 13th. We thought it would be fun to set up a mobile studio right next to the choice booth in the exhibit hall and talk to our guests right out in the open. We didn't exactly have a captive audience, like we didn't have people showing up to watch us, but there were some folks checking us out as they walked by. So it was great to be able to do this in a public setting and also to connect with and speak to our guests face-to-face, surrounded by the buzz and activity of the show floor. And some of you even stopped by to tell us your regular listeners, so thank you for that. This particular episode is brought to you by the MIT Press, and in it I speak with Emily Farrell, Library Services Director, and Nick Lindsay, Director of Journals and OA, and we talk about not just the MIT Press's publishing goals, but its close relationship with the MIT libraries, and also its technology ambitions through its collaborations with MIT's Media Lab and the Knowledge Futures Group. So, here's me welcoming our guests from the great city of Cleveland during the 2019 ACRL Conference. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of The Authority File and the editorial director here at Choice. This episode is being recorded live on the show floor of the uh, ACRL 2019 conference in Cleveland. Joining me here at the Choice booth are Nick Lindsay, director of journals and open access at uh, MIT Press. Hi, Nick. How you doing, Bill? I'm doing well. And Emily Farrell, library sales executive at the MIT Press. Hi, Emily. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? (laughs) Good. Good. Uh, We're all here to discuss the things that separate mission-driven university press publishing from its economically advantaged cousins. First, we'll set the scene with a little exposition on the current state of scholarly publishing with some of the, and some of the newsy major developments over the past year. Um, So Nick, let's start with you. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the consolidation uh, that's been going on in the scholarly publishing market, both vertical and horizontal. Uh, what has that meant for the strategic direction at a press like the MIT Press? It's a really good question. It presents some really significant challenges for MIT Press. I mean, and not just MIT Press, but all university right. press publishers right now. So, uh, given that so many of the commercial publishers have purchased elements of the infrastructure of scholarly communication, mm. um, it's meant that university presses are now starting to rely on systems that are actually provided by their competitors. Mm-hmm. This is not a great place for us to be. So, right. and this isn't just, for example, Elsevier purchasing Ares and their editorial manager product, but it's also mm-hmm. things like Wiley purchasing Adapon. And we, we continue to use both systems, but right. we don't know what the long-term future really holds when those systems are held by those kinds of companies. Right. Mm-hmm. So for the press, what it really has meant is that we've started to look further afield uh, at other solutions that we might be able to implement. Mm-hmm. So for example, um, The press looks and has helped uh, develop uh, some of the tools that have been brought forth by the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation. So COCO has, for example, uh, developed a manuscript management system that's open source, and that one is being employed by Hindawi and MIT Press, participated in the actual creation of that system. Right. Um, But closer to home, really what we want is we want the academy to really start to take control of a lot of these tools. Mm -hmm. And to that end, at MIT Press, we've developed a group called the Knowledge Futures Group. And what Knowledge Futures Group has done is that it's it's an organization that's a, um, it's both MIT Press and the MIT Media Lab together. And what they're really looking to do is build those kinds of tools that we can start to use to be able to publish our material Mm -hmm. uh, on the web uh, in a way that's um, consistent with our values. Okay. So uh, we, you know, baby steps. Yep. Uh, we're starting to get there. There are some books already up on the main platform that's been developed by the KFG, mm-hmm. which is called PubPub. Yep. And there's, for example, there's an excellent version of Frankenstein that's mm-hmm. up there called Frankenbook. Um, the Media Lab has developed a new journal called the Journal of Design and Science. Yep. Uh, and then there are several other communities that have been brought together to place their material on the PubPub platform, upwards of, I think, 250 now. So it's really successful and has really been taken off. And it is a great example of how university presses and the larger university infrastructure can work together Mm -hmm. to be able to bring some of this uh, infrastructure back home. That's great. I just wanted to go back to one of the things you said earlier about the larger publishers buying up um, pieces of the publishing infrastructure themselves. 
what's what's kind of behind that what's motivating them them to to do that um, right i th- well you know i i can only say as an outsider yeah. but i th- i think uh the, you know the biggest thing that they're seeing is that there's been significant change in the scholarly communication landscape mm-hmm. with the implementation of open access right. and they're seeing declining revenues for their subscription business so what they want to do is start to get their uh, fingers into many different aspects of scholarly communication, right. including things like researcher workflow, metrics, preprint servers, mm-hmm. uh, publishing platforms, right. manuscript management things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they see that those are the areas that are going to continue to have growth into the future and be able to offset some of the losses that they're seeing in their subscription business. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you yeah. seeing the same thing, Emily? I mean, I think, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, just this, the huge shift to, to services and right. that it is very much about infrastructure and where revenues are moving. And, uh, you know, as library budgets decrease or as library budgets are increasingly eaten up by journals packages, which are, despite some of them dissolving, mm-hmm. big deals really take up a lot of uh, a lot of most libraries' budgets and the year-on-year increases eat into monograph budgets and for university presses that is you know, a major right. major issue. Mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, but yeah, that the, the services move is, is part of that sort of decrease in where revenue is coming from elsewhere. Right, right. Okay. Um, seems uh, that for a lot of librarians, their relationships with the big publishers have gotten so fraught that the state could almost be characterized as outright conflict. Big deals have locked libraries into consistent year-over-year price increases that librarians feel are unsustainable. Book packages have been uh, have diminished the importance of selection, and at the same time, uh, more and more articles are, and books are being published open access. Uh, could each of you talk a bit about your personal view of the market from where you sit as the uh, as li- in library sales and as the director of journals and open access? Um, why have things heated up so much? Um, what do you think personally could be done? Um, I guess really sort of what's your perspective on the state overall of academic publishing? Mm. Emily, we can start with you. Yeah, I think that in part it's increased pressure from all sides of the system so i mean we talk a lot about what's going on on the publishing side and the you know certainly in sales the connection is uh with library sales we're talking to libraries so we Mm. hear a lot about what's going on with libraries but at the same time you know following conversations or having conversations with academics um the increased intense pressure to publish the amount of work that's being published um, the the time in your career where you're expected to be publishing. I right. mean, you know, at this point, you cannot find a job in the incredibly competitive market finishing a PhD without having already published in top journals or mm-hmm. publishing a monograph. And that's such a change even from 10 years ago. Um, and the, the quantity of publications, those expectations on academics um, also really feed into, you know, what, what's going on in this market and how how do libraries cope with that increase yeah. how do uh how do publishers convince libraries that they need to continue to have all of this in their collection mm-hmm. when they just can't afford to yeah. anymore but how do you make choices about what what's valuable and yeah. what's not yeah. um so i think uh to, to me, there's a lot more conversation to be had about all of the pieces mm-hmm. that, are, that are affecting the market, including bringing academics themselves into the conversation right. mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that what we're seeing at the moment, you know, we're in very transitional times. And as you've said, we talked about earlier, the, the shift to services is one point at which we're seeing change. Um, you know, slow shifts, looking at altmetrics and things like that on the right. scholar side. Um, but I think we're just we're at a point where things certainly do have to change, and Plan S is one example. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of things where we're seeing, you know, the strain is affecting change. Right. Yeah, it does seem like there's a lot of decisions being made, sort of on behalf of teaching faculty who who may not be as aware or as ideologically aligned with some of this as um, other other, you know, cohorts within the within the, the academy who are you know, pushing for, for this kind yeah. of changes. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm a huge fan of making efforts where we can to yeah. bring scholars into the conversation. Right. So. Yeah, good point. Yeah. I mean, from my side, 
you know, MIT Press is not large enough to actually have a big deal. You know, we only have yeah. 40 journals. So the demise of the big deal, if that's what happens, is could potentially be an opportunity for university presses and other nonprofit publishers to to realize um, some gains. Yeah. So, uh, and I don't necessarily mean that in terms of, you know, libraries having more resources to spend on university press publications, so that would certainly be nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think about it more in terms of can libraries have or start to think about more innovative ways in which they can start to change the scholarly communication landscape. Yeah. So just to give you an example, we um, at the press, we recently started a new journal called Quantitative Science Studies, which is uh, going to be the official journal of the International Society for Scientometrics and Infometrics. Mm -hmm. um, and that journal really came about because we had significant support both from MIT libraries and uh, a library in Germany who are willing to put money forward to be able to offset the APCs that would otherwise be charged against the authors. Right. So we, we could actually, there was enough there that we could have the first three years uh, be completely APC free so wow. anyone can actually publish in the journal openly, mm -hmm. uh, which is terrific. And yeah. it, it, I think it shows a real forward leaning or forward thinking um, spirit mm -hmm. that the library has really undertaken to be able to you know, try and change what the paradigm is for scholarly communication moving forward and getting yeah. away from subscription models. Excellent. Okay, so a few weeks ago there was a, a really interesting post in the Scholarly Kitchen blog um, by Roger Schoenfeld called uh, Is the Value of the Big Deal in Decline? I don't know if you guys have seen that, but um, in his post he argues, uh, quote, leakage or uh, pirated use of scholarly articles has really given uh, librarians a significant amount of leverage in dealing with the big publishers. Uh, the clearest example um, is in the University of California system's very public breakdown in negotiations with Elsevier, uh, which he cites in that post. Um, what do you think um, of that idea that leakage has strengthened librarians' negotiating position? Um, That's a. a do you want to? Uh, I think it's a complicated question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that's sort of the easy response, uh -huh. I suppose. But I, I mean, I can't speak for librarians, but in following a lot of discussions and you know knowing something about sort of the general ethos of librarianship, leakage is a huge concern to mm -hmm. librarians too um you know if nothing else the data privacy issues surrounding right. leakage yep. is is massive um mm -hmm. you know most of where that content is leaking is through people's personal login yeah. information mm -hmm. and that's that's a problem yep. um so i think that i mean librarians might not not necessarily say it publicly and but maybe privately they're there's, you know, there's some excitement about the the sort of ideological effect, mm -hmm. but I think in in sort of the in real terms, it's it's seen as a lot more problematic than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I don't think that's necessarily what is really pushing the change. Right. I think you know what Nick was saying about you know the closer relationships between yeah, policy and, and uh, what libraries are doing, mm -hmm. these sorts of relationships with uh, university press publishers and libraries willing to help support APCs and so forth, that's really you know, where, where the change is. Right, so the leakage the is one, one component of a much larger mm. you know, package of, of things influencing what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you certainly can't ignore it, yeah. but um, I don't think anyone would would openly say that it's a positive yeah. effect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a that's a fair assessment. I mean, I, just this morning, in advance of this talk, I took a look at Green Lab's um, Sci-Hub uh, content d uh, database that they have, where you can actually determine how much of a publisher's content is available on Sci-Hub. And you know, MIT Press, it's eighty-four percent. So that's that's wow. a significant chunk yeah. of our our material that is mm -hmm. freely available through the SciHub platform, and that can be, you know, look, that that matters. Mm -hmm. It does matter. Yeah. I mean, we do have forty journals. About a quarter of our program is open access, but the remainder, the other three quarters, they're, they're still subscription-based titles. And the the money that's earned from those titles doesn't just support the press, but supports a whole network 
of copy editors and proofreaders yeah. and compositors and uh, societies that need that revenue to be able to support their operations, pay for the managing editor, and so forth. Right. So, um, you know, leakage can, I, I completely agree with Emily that this is part of a larger constellation of issues, but leakage does play a role. I think, you know, it's it's been a very positive thing that, for example, with the Elsevier University of California negotiations, uh, University of California has been very explicit in their documentation to right. say, do not we do not encourage users to go to Sci-Hub yep. as an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, these are the other legal ways that you can approach the issue of article sharing and other places that you might be able to find mm -hmm. content legally, but we, we don't encourage this kind of piracy. Yeah. So I, and, I, and that, I think, is, is consistent with what I've seen from other librarians, certainly at MIT and elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think that also connects to an, another point where that is it's easy to focus on the large publishers that have been involved in big deals right. like mm -hmm. Elsevier, like you know the big the big publishers and how leakage might be affecting them. Um, but I find in a lot of conversations that 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 takes up a little more time than looking at how it affects smaller publishers. So yeah. to know that 84% of MIT press content is out there, it's, it's, it's everybody's concerning. Problem. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That, it, that, it, that it really does affect small and mid-sized publishers yep. and probably more than, than the larger ones. Right, there's a larger impact, I guess, on a smaller operation than it would be, yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about Plan S a little bit, sort of its implications for um, nonprofit publishers like yourselves. Um, the MIT Press really has a strong commitment to open access for both its scholarly monographs and its journals. Um, but even beyond its own properties, the press is pushing open publishing outward. Um, could you talk a little bit about those initiatives, things like PubHub, uh, Pub, which you've already mentioned, um, for our listeners who may never have heard about it before? Um, what, can you talk a little bit more about it and how it works? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's it's not my domain of expertise, but I'll happy to tell you what I know. So the the Pup Up platform has been developed out of the MIT Media Lab mm -hmm. uh, since 2016, I believe. He's a graduate student there uh, who's subsequently become a postdoc, and he has joined this group that we've created called the Knowledge Futures Group, yeah. which is designed to be able to build these kinds of tools like Pup Up. What Pup Up is is a um, it's a publishing platform that's intended to be able to provide a whole series of really flexible features that should be fairly intuitive for any user to use. So, uh, and can allow for some fairly sophisticated publish publishing to take place on the platform. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's very um, robust audio video audio-visual features on there. So it's very easy to bring in video and audio content and just drop it right in. Um, it has very, uh, it ha there are some examples on the platform where there's very um, sophisticated data visualization yep. tools that have been brought into an iframe and put into the context of an article. Um, it's, you know, it, it's really intended to be an open source, open access, academy-based publishing platform that the academy can use to be able to get its material out. Right. So, um, you know, we, we do have some, we have some instances where um, MIT Press has placed content on the platform, but it's also taken off within the larger MIT community. Mm -hmm. So the MIT libraries, for example, have been using it fairly uh, extensively. So you, if, you, um, if you look for the MIT Open Access Task Force report right. or the MIT Future of the Libraries report, they've been both placed on the PubPub -Pub platform mm -hmm. and they both allow, and they both generate a significant amount of commentary Right. As, as, as a result, because the platform really allows and encourages... Um, that kind of annotation. And annotation, yeah. exactly. Right. Um, and it comes with uh, all the bells and whistles that you'd expect in a, a serious um, publishing platform. So mm -hmm. it, it's really evolving. It's in its fifth iteration right now, I think. Um, but it's really a significant part of our um, publishing strategy moving forward. Okay. Are there specific milestones that you're looking for in that respect in terms of... Um, or benchmarks that that is showing you that this will be these kinds of initiatives are, are gaining enough traction to you know continue pursuing them and 
Well, I, I would say we've already hit one. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have, I think, upwards of 250 communities now on PubPub, which is really impressive, awesome. including things like a, a blockchain journal from Stanford. Mm -hmm. So other, not just MIT, it's not just the MIT community, it's it's the rest of the academic community yeah. that's really um, starting to take uh, a shine to it because yeah. you know, there's a serious need for a lightweight, intuitive, but um, uh, fully featured mm -hmm. publishing platform for universities and university departments and university libraries yeah. to be able to um, handle the publishing projects that they come up yep. as they come up, yep. um, and they they are they are legion. I mean, they, I I spent uh, an hour yesterday talking with a guy at a mm -hmm. department at MIT who knew nothing about PubPub but has an idea for a journal. We figured out this is really going to be a good platform for them to work for, work yeah. on. Um, and they they will very likely use it in the future. So I, you know, I think there's a, there's real serious potential here. Good, yeah. Emily. Are you like with in your work with libraries? Are you talking about these initiatives as well? Or librarians are definitely paying attention yeah. and uh, and are asking questions about you know what what it is and what we're doing with it and why and yeah. um, so. You know, it's it's great to see that there is interest and investment mm -hmm. there, and I think that that will only continue to help grow yeah. the content that is available on PubPub and who's using it and the diversity of users. Um, and I think it also, I mean, being having Knowledge Futures Group, um, seeing things like PubPub develop, it also speaks to you know the fact that being the University Press of MIT, um, you know, has provides us with a lot of opportunity to, to innovate as a press and, um, you know, hopefully also pay it forward and right. have that be available for other scholars and mm -hmm. libraries to work with, yeah. which is really exciting. Good. Yeah. On that note, um, for both Emily and Nick, and let's continue that kind of train of thought and talk about what's exciting you right now about um, scholarly publishing and what's going on both at MIT or even um, further abroad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, like, we're, we're both so filled with answers. We oh, yeah. Right, right, we're pointing at each other, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, clearly the Knowledge Futures Group is the biggest yeah. uh, um, effort that we have going at MIT mm -hmm. Press. It's, it's really, you know, a sandbox for us to be able to yeah. test out a whole range of ideas. Mm -hmm. Pop-up is one of them, but there are other things that they're working on. I mean, to me, the, the, the big revelation over the last couple of years has been working more closely with MIT libraries mm -hmm. on their uh, support for our program and working more tightly with them. Yeah. Um, and it's not just on supporting the journals program, but they've been very open to supporting the MIT Press Books program as well. So yeah. to give you an example of that, we have a, a, a series called the Strong Ideas series, yeah. which is about the impact of digital technology or the impact of technology on society, culture, mm -hmm. the kinds of cities we build, the, you know, kinds of lives we're going to lead. And um, they they have sponsored the series completely, all the books, all 12 books that are gonna, gonna, going to be coming out, um, and to make them all open access, no. which is fabulous. Yeah. And, you know, to have that, that kind of commitment from the library um, is terrific, but I don't know that that would have come without the really close interaction that not just me, but several other people at MIT Press have had with the library. I think we're, we're working, you know, very, very hand in glove at the moment. And uh, seeing these kinds of things come to fruition as a result has been very gratifying. That's excellent, yeah. yeah. And I would say similarly, I mean, you know, as we were talking about before, just the odd point we're at where there are all these pressures in the library market, in the publishing market, mm -hmm. and that we're seeing that that after you know a lot of talk about how things will have to change i think we're finally seeing, seeing some yeah. real pressures that i mean that are pushing forward um uh change and and i i think as nick said we're really in a very privileged position to be a press that reports into the library and to have a very close relationship to have direct feedback from a library like MIT has, mm -hmm. I mean, and to to be able to take that and uh, 
and innovate and you know consider how we move forward as a press. I mean, the the launching of our new ebooks platform, MIT Press Direct, is is as a consequence of conversations with librarians at MIT, but also mm-hmm. other librarians um, about well, should is this something we should do? And right. and I think being able to have that connection directly to the library community and to sort of be able to show them how invested we are with the open access program, with Knowledge Futures Group, um, that there, there, there is a certain level of trust that you know, the ways that we're trying to push forward innovation in publishing is something that will be in libraries' interests. Right. Um, and that, to me, is exciting. Yeah. That's good. Anybody comfortable making any predictions at this point where <laughs> <laughs> where you think the market's headed in terms of the innovation that's now happening how much of it might be sustainable or how much of it might stick um, or you know how it might the ripple effects might kind of continue outwards yeah. in the longer term I mean it's it's a tough yeah. question yeah. <laughs> and I noticed you didn't give any time frame so <laughs> I know. Um, the best I can say is that you know I, th- I think when I look back at what our program, our journalist program looked like five yeah. years ago compared yeah. to what it looks like today, clearly the biggest difference is that we have a lot more open access publishing. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, we were at 31 journals in 2014. We're at 40 now. And in the interim, those nine extra journals, those are all open access titles. Yeah. So we've gone from two to 11 in the yeah. OA space. So I think the acceleration of open access is clearly something that we're going to see yeah. coming. Yeah. Um, there is an... Uh, I think there's another aspect of this, though, or another aspect of journalist publishing that's been really um, beneficial, which is the rise of companies like Digital Science to provide a whole series of tools that university presses and others can use to be able to better illuminate their content or provide tools to researchers and readers right. to get um, more use out of scholarly mm-hmm. communication. Uh, whether or not all of these entities will continue to exist into yeah. the future, I think. For some, the business models are a little dicey, Mm -hmm. and it's not entirely certain whether they'll be there. But it does feel like I am getting contacted a couple times a month from someone who's got some new idea about what they want to do with uh, our journal's content in some way to present it that could be more useful, um, be it in terms of metrics or features that we can offer on the site. So, you know, I... I, I'm certainly optimistic yeah. about what the future is for journals publishing, but it is undeniable that it's going to look very different right. three to five right. years from now. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Emily? I mean, I would I would say likewise on the book side. Yeah. I mean, uh, so much has changed in the last decade, and yet at the same time, so many predictions have not come true. Yep, right. I mean. I know I'm not alone in still reading print books. Um, <laughs> so you know the death the death of print is, was grossly exaggerated. Um, so at the same time, you know, I don't expect that library budgets will suddenly start expanding drastically. Um, and I would expect to see that sort of consolidation of, of uh, infrastructure and services on the larger publisher side will continue. Will continue. Yeah. Um, and, but I also think to some degree that means that we'll also continue to see this consolidation between university presses and the libraries that they work with mm-hmm. and the institutions they work with. I think for a good stretch there, um, you know, university presses were existing sort of in a more separated sphere from their institutions, and uh, and that has has yeah the the nature of what things look like economically yeah. has changed that relationship, and I think for the better. Mm-hmm. So um, that may mean we'll see more of a gap between what university presses and commercial publishers are doing, mm-hmm. but uh, but I think that it's uh, it's. Yeah, there's a lot of adventure still ahead for University Press Publishing. Right. Yeah. Good. Well, Emily, Nick, thank you very much for joining us on uh, The Authority File. Thanks, Bill. It was fun. Thanks for having us. We just heard from Emily Farrell and Nick Lindsay from the MIT Press. This concludes another one of our episodes recorded live from the exhibit hall floor at the 2019 ACRL conference held in Cleveland, Ohio. You can find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. 
just click on the Librarianship drop-down. On Choice360.org, you'll also find information on Choice's entire product platform, including Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, Choice Webinars, resources for college libraries, and our white papers, and a whole lot more. A great way to keep up with the Authority File is to join the Choice Authority File Facebook group, which you can access via the Choice Reviews Facebook page. As a member of the group, you can give us feedback, suggest podcast participants, chat with other listeners, and submit new topic, topic ideas. Sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choice's advertising manager, Pam Marino. And the production and editing are done by Choice's digital media specialist, Mark Turks. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.